Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation by Hunter Wines and Joe Luther. They'll be presenting the topic of establishing a more efficient method for mercury detection in soil using a handheld X-ray fluorescent spectrometry. And uh, we really appreciate if you would give them your undivided attention during the duration of the presentation. Cool. Um, so yeah, we're going to start today uh, by basically talking about how we use this um, progressive name your price tool esque um, looking device to uh, detect how much mercury is in soil. Um, so you guys might be wondering why mercury might be something that we are interested in finding within the soil. Um, it is a global pollutant that can cause a lot of issues when it's introduced to an aquatic ecosystem. Um, it's a element that doesn't break down very easily in its natural environment. Um, so it can stick around for a lot longer than you might want it to. Um, and because of that, um, because of that, it will biomagnify um, within different levels of um, a food chain. Um, so in the diagram on the left side, or your right side, um, the trout would have like the most amount of mercury, and that's typically what would be eaten by um, most of us. Um, and so, uh, if there's too much mercury within, there's too much mercury within a system, uh, can build up and there will be fish consumption advisories that are put onto um, the, an area so that basically to present, prevent us from having health issues. Um, a big issue with mercury, if you eat too much of it, it can cause issues in childbirth or pregnancies within women. Um, so an example of where we might have too much mercury um, is in the South River um, where we actually did our study. Um, if you're not familiar with that, we have Harrisonburg. Um, is about, that's where we are right now, um, and Waynesboro is about 30 minutes south of there, um, where the South River flows through, um, and there was a DuPont facility that was put, that was built in Waynesboro in the 1920s, it was using acid, it was building, it was making acetate yarn um, to produce um, textiles, and it used mercury within that process to build that yarn, um, and Although, Mer or although DuPont tried to um, recycle the, the mercury, some of it actually got out into the river. And it was at that point that there was started to become this pollution. Or, um, and so um, they actually stopped using mercury in 1950. Uh, but by that point, there was already, the damage had already been done and, and that mercury had already leaked out into the river um, and caused the issue that we ended up resulting in a 150 mile long fish consumption advisory. <coughs> so, um, there became a need for remediation. Um, in the 1970s, it was first found out that, or as far first realized quite, or the extent of the mercury pollution in the South River. Um, and so, the, the fish consumption advisory was put on then almost 20 years after all mercury had been stopped being used at the DuPont facility. Um, and then in 1984, DuPont actually agreed to um, a settlement with the Commonwealth of Virginia to do a hundred year, um, to do a hundred year monitoring plan uh, to try and figure out whether or not the mercury would take care of itself. Um, but through that study, it was realized that the most of the mercury was already in the, in the banks and that there needed to be something done about it to clean up the river in such a way that it would be able to uh, be safe and eventually clean up the health of the of the fish in the river to be able to eat again um, and so Kind of the first step of the remediation process is to know where the mercury is um, If you don't know where it's at then it's hard to fix it to get, get it out of the river um, And so currently it's using it currently on the South River um, Those that are remediated use EPA method 7471a um, which is conducted by Lancaster Labs and is located in Pennsylvania. Um, it has a few downsides to it. Um, it is because it is in Pennsylvania and the work is being done in the South River in Waynesboro. Uh, it can take a long time to get those samples up there. It costs a lot of money to, to run the samples through the process. Um, and overall, it can take a really long time um, to get the samples back and to understand what the results of your sampling campaign might have been where you took those samples and you needed to know um, how much mercury was actually there. Um, one of the fastest that you can do is like two weeks to get your samples back, which takes 
a long time by the time you've sent out a team and then want to know what is there now, but you're, you have to wait two weeks, a lot of times a month or two, um, to actually know what's going on, where you were just at. Um, and so kind of posed the question of, is there a better way to detect how much mercury um, is there um, without having to go through this whole long process? Um, and that was whenever uh, our professor, Dr. Brown, was kind of introduced to this technology of XRF, which stands for X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. Um, and basically, this technology would shoot X-rays out of this part of the gun, or out of the out of the device, uh, where it would shoot into the dirt. And at which point, the X-rays would then come into the, so this is an atom or a uh, molecule of mercury, uh, where it would excite. As the X-rays come in, they would excite an electron, and it would shoot out. And as that electron shoots away, um, one of the electrons will move down into a lower ring, and energy would be emitted that the that the device then captures. Um, and as that the, the device measures that amount of mercury, we're able, or that energy, we're able to get an idea of how much mercury is there. Um, and so it's not a new technology to uh, mercury specifically. Uh, it's currently used for like lead-based paints. Uh, you can like point to a wall, and if there's any lead in that paint, you might you would see it there uh, through the results of your test. Uh, or it's used on scrap yards, so you might want to know how much of a metal might be aluminum or steel or whatever that might be. Um, and so we've kind of posed the question of whether or not you could use this technology to figure out how much mercury would be within a, a sample of soil that you were curious about. Um, so previously to this project, um, there was a guy named Nathan Irving who developed a calibration for um, this device that, that was specific to mercury. Um, and a calibration is the, um, just to make sure that we get this right, is relating the curve, a curve of energy of basically saying, okay, this much energy was received, which we know is this much mercury. So we used 10 samples from the South River that the known amount of mercury was in, and we're able to say, okay, well, like, we know that this sample had 60 uh, milligrams per kilogram mercury in it, and so this much energy received from the device would equate to that 60 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and so he developed that calibration, and we then took the project from there, and we asked a few different questions. Um, the first one being, uh, how accurate was that new calibration? Like, does it work? Uh, it's never, it is a new calibration, so we had to figure out whether or not it was something that would work. Um, we also wanted to ask the question of, what is the detection limit for that method? So how low, or what is the smallest amount of mercury that our device can detect? Uh, and then also, <coughs> can the results be achieved uh, with accur accuracy and precision in the field? So can we take this device out to the South River and actually get those results that we're hoping for. So we developed a three-part study to go through that. Um, first off, starting out with a field method validation to figure out whether or not that, um, whether or not the field method, or the, our, our results were, excuse me, the field method validation was used to figure out whether or not our calibration was what it needed to be, uh, whether or not it was accurate. And then as we found out that our results were kind of what we wanted to do, or were looking good, we noticed that there wasn't, there might be an issue with moisture in the samples, and we conducted a study to figure out whether or not there was anything going on with, with our results because of moisture. Um, and then finally, we developed a field demonstration to take our XRF out and say, okay, cool, this is what it looks like if we were to actually use this technology in the field for remediation purposes. So like Joe mentioned, this was a three-part study, and the first part of this three-part study was a field method validation. And what we were doing here is we were trying to see if this new calibration and method detection limit that Nathan had worked on was going to be able to be comparable to method 747-1A. So what we did was a split study, and a split study is basically working alongside another team to use our results together to see if they line up. And what we did was we went out with an environmental sampling company named AECOM, we worked with them for a week in the field. While they were collecting samples, they would take a soil sample. We would then take it from them, use our device, test our parameters, and see if, um, take that measurement down for ourselves. We, they would then bottle it up and send it off to Lancaster Labs in Pennsylvania. 
Lancaster Labs would run a test on it, and then we would get it back in our JMU laboratory here, and we would then analyze the soil sample again. So we have three sets of measurements for one soil sample. And in this study, we were looking at how accurate are our results, how precise are our results, and then what is the sensitivity on our device? How low are we able to detect mercury in these soil samples? So the first thing that we looked at was the method detection limit. What we were aiming to do here is verify the method detection limit that Nathan had created. And the method detection limit is simply how low can our device read the mercury. So it's a measurement of sensitivity on how well our device was going to work. And we did several different trials on which method detection limit we thought would work best. And we found that a 60 second analysis time gave us a method detection limit of 7.4 milligrams per kilogram. And that's a very significant number because the action level for mercury remediation on, on the South River is 23 milligrams per kilogram. And an action level is basically the amount of mercury at, above that action level requires remediation. It's a level that shows above this fish consumption advisories ensue and the site needs to be remediated. So our method detection limit is well below that action level which is good for us and shows us that we had a great method detection limit. And then compared to other studies, we looked at other studies that have used XRF for mercury analysis, and we found that they really were not lower than 50 milligrams per kilogram. And then the analysis times were generally pretty high. So compared to the other XRF mercury studies, our method detection limit was significantly lower with a smaller analysis time of 60 seconds. So the next thing we looked at was how accurate is our device? And we did two accuracy tests, and the first of one was on our field samples. And what we were doing here was we were comparing our field samples with our XRF, our lab samples with our XRF, versus the method 7471A. And like Joe mentioned, that's the EPA approved method. So basically what they send back to us as what they recorded is seen to be true or what is accurate. So we did two different types of statistics on this one, and just to define those in case you don't know, we did an R-squared analysis, and an R-squared just basically tells us the agreement between these two methods. So an R-squared of 1.0 would insinuate 100% agreement between the two methods. It'd be one to one. And if like we shot at 10 milligrams per kilogram with our device, that means that Lancaster Labs would also send back 10 milligrams per kilogram with theirs. And in the first figure here on the left, this is the field XRF results versus method 7471A, and we got an R-squared value of 0 0.93, which is pretty good. It's, it's about 93% agreement between our two methods. And then the second statistic that we looked at was the slope of this line, which would be the M in this equation. And the slope is going to tell us whether we're over or under predicting our results. And we can see that we're slightly under predicting in the field with our field, XRF in the field. And then we looked at the XRF results in our laboratory versus method 7471A laboratory, and we got an R-squared value of 0 0.97, which again is about 97% agreement between the two methods, and it's still a slope that's showing that we're under-predicting slightly. So the next thing that we looked at for accuracy was spike samples, and what a spike sample is, is you basically take an, a, a, a set of uncontaminated dirt that has no mercury in it, you have elemental mercury, and you add that mercury to the dirt that's not contaminated. So you have a known concentration of the mercury in that soil sample. So we used these spikes, we made nine spikes, they range from 10 to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, and we were using our XRF device on that to determine the accuracy. And one of the things that we were looking at was the percent recovery on our device and our instrument, and percent recovery just basically tells us how accurate we are to a known value. So 100% recovery would mean that we know that there's 10 milligrams per kilogram of mercury in this soil sample, and we were able to detect 10 milligrams. So it's 100% of that was able to be recovered by our device. And we found that our average recovery was 102%. So we were able to recover 100% of the mercury that we thought should be there, and we were only off by 2%, overshooting it just a little bit. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the average recovery was, the error was between plus and minus 16%. So then we did a linear regression on the two, the two data sets, and we found that we got an R-squared value of 0 0.9999, which is 99.99% agreeance, which is almost perfect. And even when we did that, Dr. Brent didn't believe us. 
and he, he made us do that statistic several times, and we still kept getting 0 0.999. So it is that it agreed that well, and you can see here that it is over predicting slightly on spike samples. So. So the next thing that we looked at was we wanted to see how reproducible our results were. That's what precision is going to tell us. We wanted to see, well, if we, that's great that we can get accurate a few times, but can we re consistently reproduce these results? So what we did was a measurement and sample triplicate analysis. And what triplicate analysis is means we just shoot the sample three times on the same sample. So measurement triplicates, we keep the nose of the instrument in the same spot and run it for three 60 second trials. We don't move the nose of the instrument at all, it stays in the same spot. But sample, tri sample triplicate analysis would require us to take the sample, lift the nose of the instrument, mix the dirt up again, homogenize it, and then place the nose of the instrument back down, take the sample, lift it up, and do it for a third time. And the statistic that we were looking at for this one was coefficient of variation. And what coefficient of variation is gonna tell us is a measurement of variability. So basically, if we were to shoot this sample three times, what is the agreement between those three, t those three trials that we ran on that sample? And as you can see here, we found that the coefficient of variation for our XRF in the field was 18%. In the lab with the XRF, it was 15%. And then method 747-1A had a coefficient of variation of 19%. So our device had a lower coefficient of variation than the EPA approved method. And then when we compared our XRF to the method 747-1A, we found that the coefficient of variation was around 16%. So we can see that our XRF results were more precise, they were more reproducible than method 747-1A that we were comparing to. So we have those results and we were feeling pretty good about it. Uh, but there's kind of this question about uh, whether or not the moisture within each sample was having an effect on the results that we were getting. Um, so we created a study um, to figure out uh, whether or not that moisture was having an effect. Um, we ended up using those spike samples that Hunter was just talking about um, to kind of build that, that study, um, where basically we started out um, by taking North River soil from a river that's near the South River that is relatively the same um, composition of soil, um, and then we added like, like Connor was saying, the mercury to those samples uh, to create the concentration that we were looking for. Um, and then we took each one, or each sample, and, and uh, measured it at 0% moisture, and then we added water to it until it was at a, at a moisture level of 20%. Um, it's important to note that the calibration that Nathan developed uh, whenever he was working on this project uh, was set to an average moisture of 14.53%. And so we chose to, to do our measurements above and below that, that to figure out what, or if there was anything going on with moisture there. Um, so we ended up having our results of that study um, found that we were having a consistent over prediction or under prediction. Um, so for, this is our, um, ideally we would have our green line that Hunter's marking out is, um, that's the ideal, that's saying that if there's 10, 10 milligrams per kilogram of mercury there, then that's what we were shooting. But we were actually, for 0% moisture, we're consistently overshooting that a little bit. And then whenever it was, whenever we had uh, brought up to 20% moisture, we were actually undershooting it. Um, so that was this consistency that was going on with each sample that we were doing. Um, and so that was basically above or below our um, set calibration moisture was determining whether or not we were over predicting or under predicting it. Um, so the question then became for us, well, could we develop a formula that would um, adjust for that? Uh, so we worked for a long time to figure out what was going on here in this formula uh, to basically apply that to those same results and figure out whether or not we could bring those, that over prediction or under prediction closer to that ideal line that we were looking for. And so after we applied that, um, we actually had a lot better results, as you can see in this graph. Um, so once we had applied that to this, to the same data that we had just taken, uh, our zero percent moisture actually tightened up a whole lot, and then our our twenty percent moisture tightened up too, but not quite as much. Uh, and so we were actually able to take the samples, apply this correction to them, and we were able to figure out that 
overall moisture is not going to play a huge effect in whether or not we are coming up with an accurate result um, whenever we are using this instrument in the field. <coughs> so the third part of this study was we've seen that this method's validated now. We've addressed one of our major concerns. Now we want to show its effectiveness to the people who are going to be using it. So we decided to design a field demonstration campaign where we spent six days going out <coughs> to an area of the South River on Hopeman Parkway, right around the Hopeman Parkway Bridge. And in that six day campaign, we were able to delineate about 4,000 feet of linear stream bank. And delineate the bank just basically means take the measurements, analyze the measurements, and have some sort of plan about what we want to do with those. So the overall goal of this third part of this project was to show that this is a suitable alternative to the lab method. So we've, we've seen that the results look like that. Now we want to actually demonstrate it in the field its usefulness. So the first thing that we looked at was the efficiency of this device. We found that a crew of about three to five people was necessary to operate this device with maximum efficiency and a minimum of three people. And why that's necessary is one person is operating the instrument along the bank another person is taking the sample from the bank as we're moving along, and the third person is transporting that sample from the bank to the instrument operator and also marking out the next sampling location. And we'll talk about sampling locations in a few slides, but it's important to know that that other person was marking that out for the samples. And on average, we were able to collect about 41 samples per day, which leads to about 81 analyses in total per day um, with the device. And in one given day, we were able to analyze and delineate 667 linear feet of stream bank, which is a good amount of stream bank that was able to be analyzed in any given day. So overall, this is very, we were working with op great efficiency in the field with this device. So the next thing we wanted to look at, well, what was the raw data from this sampling campaign? And we had about 243 samples collected, and the average mercury concentration of those was 35.5 milligrams per kilogram. And that's a significant number because 46% of those 243 samples were above the action level <coughs> that I mentioned earlier of 23 milligrams per kilogram. So this area that we were even just demonstrating doing a sampling campaign on is significant for the overall cleanup of the South River as 46% of the samples need to be addressed anyway. And some of the bigger picture things that we were looking at with when we were doing the data analysis was <coughs> knowing this data real time allows us to do a lot more strategic sampling in the field. So with strategic sampling, we can know where the hot spots of the mercury are, and we're able to fully put a cap on where it starts and where it stops. So basically, where it's under that 23 milligrams per kilogram, we know where the left side of that is and the right side of it, and we can kind of bank, bank that off. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then again, we were seeing how efficient we were in the field. This is gonna save time and money. Like Joe mentioned, Lancaster Labs is all the way in Pennsylvania. And we were getting results in the field, on the spot, able to make decisions while we were out there. So. so this is kind of what a day of sampling would look like. We then took that data back to the ArcGIS lab and were able to make these figures. And you can see here that you know, all of this is green. This is below about 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then it gets yellow. So that's an area that is of concern, but it's capped by a 19. And more specifically down here, you can see there's a 12, and a 136, a 46, a 22, 53, and then it doesn't stop until there's a 9. And if you just look at this bottom picture here, you can kind of see the caps there. And then you can see the caps lined out here. So what we were aiming to illustrate here was these are the areas that need to be remediated. But we can see this area doesn't, so that's so much time that's saved. And we know exactly where the full extent of that contamination is and is stopped by this figure. So we get a pretty good idea of where we're going to stop and where the mercury is. And the sampling strategy that we used in the field was we would take a point like this and we would take a measurement. And if that measurement was above 20 milligrams per kilogram, we would go 25 feet to the right and 25 feet to the left. And we would measure those. And if any of those were hot, we would continue going 25 feet out until we found a stopping point. And then we would go 100 feet from the original point again so all, we would never be more than 100 feet from this point with our next point, if that makes sense. So it's basically going 25 feet increments to really cap where the mercury contamination was. 
So some of the big overall conclusions that we got from this was that this device is a great screening tool in the field for detecting where the mercury is. It allows decision makers to make real-time decisions in the field. You can see that if they have that information in the field, they know where to cap their sampling. So the benefit of that is if you send a, a sample off to a lab and you find that it's, it's hot, it's a high mercury concentration, you then have to deploy a team to go back to that same spot to go continue sample to really put a cap on where that mercury concentration or contamination stops. And then while we were doing this sampling campaign as well, we still saw that this is very comparable to method 747-1A with our accuracy, our precision, and our sensitivity of our device. So one of the bigger picture things that we, we found from this project as a whole was that the accuracy of our device is suitable to the lab method. With 102% recovery on our spike samples and the R squares being from 0.93 to 0.97 on the field samples, our accuracy of our device is suitable and we, had, we showed that there was excellent agreement between the two methods. As far as precision, with our median coefficient of variation between 15 and 18%, that's comparable to what method 747-1A requires. And we even included, we, we looked at method six, EPA method 1631 and 747-1A to show what they required for their methods. And method 1631 requires a coefficient of variation less than 21% and a recovery between 79 and 121%. So we're well within the requirements of that EPA method. And then the method that we were comparing to, the coefficient of variation must be less than 35%, and the recovery has to be between 75 and 125%. So just these figures alone, you can tell that we're well within the requirements of the other EPA approved methods, showing that it could be suitable to the lab method. Another big picture thing that we were looking at was, how were we able to get this method detection limit so low when historical other literature studies couldn't get it really lower than 50 milligrams per kilogram? And what we were looking at was the site-specific calibration. We were thinking that because this calibration was reflective of the soil condition of the South River, that we were able to get this lower method detection limit. And the thing about a site-specific calibration is that it reflects the background metals that are gonna be present in the soil. So we're not gonna have interfering metals from another calibration. And it also reflects the moisture composition, like Joe mentioned. Average moisture of our calibration was 14.53%, and the average of the 239 field samples that we took from the first portion of this project was around 21% moisture. So we're, we're well within, our, our calibration reflects the soil moisture in the field. And then another benefit of a site-specific calibration was that it reflects the sample composition, or the soil composition heterogeneity, which is how well it's mixed and what all is in that soil as a whole, whether it be rocks or sticks or whatever that is. So overall, our site-specific calibration was able to help us have, achieve more accurate and precise results. So going back to the moisture study that we had um, conducted before, what we found from that study was that um, based on the moisture of each sample, there was gonna be a systematic bias, basically a bias that, or a tendency to go one way or another based on whether or not it was over or under our calibration of 14.3%. Um, and so, um, because we were able to develop the, um, because we were able to, to develop the, uh, the formula that we created for this, uh, we were able to um, tighten those results up and we were able to dismiss um, moisture as like having any kind of noticeable effect on the results of our sample. Um, which was good because then we kind of were able to say, okay, cool. We have a moist sample calibration, uh, which is important for our purposes on the South River. Um, because on the South River, like you're, you're not going to be taking a sample that's going to be 100% dry, um, which is actually how like method 7471A does theirs. They take the sample to the lab, they dry it out completely, and then they figure out how much mercury is in the soil. Um, but that's not going to be something that we can feasibly do out on the river. Um, but because this was done with a calibration moisture of 14.53% and our average was about 21%, we're comparable enough to the point that we, we can f be confident in our results of what was going, what our instrument was producing. Um, and so that is 
what's going to be going on in the, in the natural environment if this was implemented into the field. So finally, now that we've seen how this is comparable to the method 747-1A, we have some hope for implementation of the device. And while we were working on the <coughs> six-day sampling campaign to demonstrate the usefulness of this device, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality came out with us and worked alongside us. And they were able to observe the effectiveness and how useful this instrument could be for um, as a screening tool in the field. And the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality ended up recommending to DuPont that DuPont purchase one of these to aid with the uh, characterization of the banks as they move along. And DuPont, being those that are responsible for the cleanup overall, wants to clean this up as fast as they can, so they're thinking about buying one of these devices for themselves because they ultimately want to speed this process up as well. And additionally, the DEQ um, mentioned that they're considering approval as a site-specific method, so if it's being if they say that we can use it, then DuPont can go ahead and use it in the field. But with all of these positives, there are bound to be some limitations of the device. It is a relatively new technology to XRF or for mercury on this site. So one of the limitations that we found was that this device can only characterize total mercury in the soil. It can't differentiate between methylated mercury or total mercury and then bound versus available. Um, and then diff the different oxidation states of the mercury. So it really only characterizes total mercury in the field, which could end up being a limitation of the device in the future. Additionally, like we mentioned, interfering elements, there could be other metals in the soil that could interfere with the device. And the one that we were really looking at was bromine in the field, because if bromine is found in high concentrations, it also affects the L beta peak of our mercury calibration. And the L beta peak is the one that we were using to characterize the mercury in the field. So with that bromine at high levels, it could impact the results of the device. And then like Joe mentioned, moisture could be a limitation. We used a moist sample calibration, so moisture wasn't a limitation as much as it could have been. But if the site-specific calibration isn't used with this device for the site that you're using on, moisture could be a limitation of the device. And then since it's not an EPA-approved method, there are a lot of um, legal and logistical hoops to jump through to use this device in the field, and we would love to see that it become a proved method for mercury detection. So, well, now we have a lot. This project is it's been a lot, but it's nowhere near done. We still have a lot of places that we want to see it go. We would love to see this device implemented as a field screening tool on the South River. Um, any way that we can help Dupont purchase one of these and use it and speed up the cleanup of the South River, we'd love to see them do that. We'd also love to see a transferable calibration made. And currently, Dr. Brent's working with some Oak Ridge National Lab samples to see if this calibration is going to be able to be transferable or if it is just site specific. So if we have a transferable calibration, that would help people see the effectiveness and the usefulness of this device for other sites than just the South River. And then we would love to see an intuitive program created. Uh, neither Joe nor I are big on software development. So we have no idea how to make a uh, calibration software that's user friendly. The one that we were using is an Excel plugin or add-on, and it was not that easy to use. And we, if you asked us to use it right now, all of us in the room would be like, yeah, give me two hours and then I might get something done. Um, it's not very intuitive. So we lo would love to see another calibration software. So unfortunately, due to time restraint, Due to time restraints, we weren't able to cover everything that we did. Um, we put a ton of time and energy into this project. Um, it's been a good part of um, the past year and a half now working on this. Um, and so we weren't able to include everything into our presentation. Um, but we did end up writing a few different publications. Um, so if you're interested in anything else that we have written, uh, you can talk to us after this and we can tell you a little bit more about what we've done. Um, I would also like to say a few thanks to a few different people. Um, big thanks to Dr. Brent um, and all the hard work that he put into it. He spent a good part of his summer working with us specifically on this project, um, as well as last spring break, and um, has just given up a ton of time and really set Honor and, up, Honor and I up well to take this project further than either one of us could have ever really thought that it could go. Um, also, big thanks to Josh Collins um, and his field team at AECOM. 
uh, for letting us come out and work with them out in the field and follow them around and ask for soil before they put it into their containers. Um, another thanks to Mike Liberati from DuPont for allowing us to come on board with this project and to fund us and get us going in the direction to make this project possible. Thanks to Calvin Jordan and uh, Vince Baden from DEQ um, for them following us around and, and kind of really taking an interest in our project and figuring out whether or not they wanted to use us on the South River. Um, thanks to Lee Drake for teaching us about how to use the XRF. Whenever we first came on the project, it was definitely an, an interesting instrument. We didn't know a ton about it, so he helped out a ton. Uh, thanks to Kyle Snow from the JMU Labs for um, kind of bringing us all together and letting us use his labs um, whenever we needed to. Uh, and then big thanks to all of y'all for coming and family and friends for supporting us throughout the year and let us know <coughs> what we've been doing this whole time. So. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>
within that. But we understand that's typically one of the processes that would go through to characterizing the bank. And then last question, are the concentrations all on a dry mass basis? Yes. So it's milligrams per kilogram yes. dry mass of soil, right? Yes, sir. Can that gun also test those other distractors that you were mentioning in that drawback slide? Can you recalibrate it and then test the, the uh, bromine and the It can. Other? It, the, the device can detect, it has set calibrations that come with it from the manufacturer that can test a variety of different metals in the soils. But basically, like bromine and mercury are both, both peak at about the same spot and so they can just be influenced by that. I think that's all about the time we have for this presentation. But uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Attend other meetings. <laughs>